Welcome to the Andrew Holland Podcast, where we talk about business, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. Now, here's your host, Andrew Holland. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Andrew Holland Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Holland. I'm a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. I've worked in the corporate world as a CPA, and I've worked in the investment and financial services industry. I've started multiple successful companies, I've sold some of them, and I'm currently operating some of them. You can find more about my background and more about the podcast at our website, theandrewhollandpodcast.com. Of course, join us on Twitter. My handle is A Holland Podcast. That's A Holland Podcast, where we continue the conversation outside the podcast. I share business thoughts throughout the week, and we overall just have a good conversation. Lastly, subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Andrew Holland Podcast. That's where we post the video version of the podcast every single week on Wednesdays. Thank you for joining us each and every Wednesday to talk about business, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. This week, we have a very special guest. He is someone that I've gotten to know in business because he owns a business right across the street from one of the businesses that I own, a coffee and bike shop with one of my business partners. And he owns a very high-end luxury dealership right across the way. So he frequently comes in for coffee almost every morning. And over the last few months, I've had the opportunity to hear more and more about his background and his story and the struggles he went to get to where he is today. And I asked him if he'd be on the podcast. So joining us today is Alex Iftikhar, one of the most honest dealers I've ever met. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex, and welcome to the Andrew Holland Podcast. My pleasure. So give our listeners a little background of how you got started. I know you've told me the story when you were in an accident in Los Angeles, you didn't have a dime in your pocket, and now you're a successful businessman, you have multiple companies, car dealerships, high-end car dealerships, rental properties across the world. Tell our background, or give our listeners some background on how did you get there, how did you start, where did you grow up, how did you grow up, uh, and how did you get this entrepreneurial drive that makes you so successful today? I think number one thing I've always, always, always for all my life, I always wanted to do something beyond my imagination. So I wanted to reach um, a goal in my life. I wanted to do something. I was not able to. Money wasn't that important for me, but I want to be able to have money to help other people out. That was my one number one goal, that if I have the money, I can help people out. And number two, I always had a very strong desire to command something, something that I can control, something I can manage, something I can differentiate for myself from my other siblings. You know, those are, most of my brothers are engineers or whatever, they're employed. How many siblings do you have? I have four living brothers right now who okay. passed away. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I worked for airlines for a while, and I was like, you know, as long as I'm working for someone, I'm never going to be able to do what I want to do. Right? Not that I didn't like my job. I had a, had a wonderful job. And then uh, back in nineteen mid mid eighties, I think I was a young uh, student driving in the street in Scott, Normandy Avenue, I believe, in Los Angeles. I got rear-ended. Guy yeah. was drunk. I was nice to him. I said, "Look, you know what? If you don't have insurance, let me get fix my car. I'll be fine." Now, was Los Angeles where you grew up? Yes. I, okay. The majority of my lived in Los Angeles from okay. teenage life. Okay. Anyway. And did you grow up? Uh, I was actually born in Pakistan. You were born in Pakistan, and then your parents moved to Los Angeles when you, when you were... My sibling came in early 60s, you know, and then my parents came. So, okay. So, I mean, I came as a teenager. And were your parents, you know, middle class? What Were, were you rich, yeah, poor? Yeah, consider them upper middle class. Okay, upper middle class. And what did they do for a living? My brother, actually, my father owned the car dealership. Okay. My mom was a homemaker. Okay. And so, what... What? Uh, well, I'll let you finish the story with, with this accident because it's so interesting. And then I'll, I'll ask you a few more questions about what makes you who you are. Is there something that you were uh, brought up in a certain way? Or is, do you believe it's just genetic that you have the drive like you just described? You wanted to command something. So we'll, we'll get that get back to that in a moment. Okay. 
So 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 you're you're driving in Los Angeles. So I got in red handed. Yeah. So right. I'm I'm a student, part time uh, employed. Uh, you know, I was a teenager, probably making almost nothing. Anyway, so I uh, during the uh, conversation with this very wealthy uh, individual who was he was quite old, I believe, in the eighties. And so anyway, he said, "Well, here's my card." Uh, I don't have my insurance card on me, so here's the card. Call me later. So and he had rear-ended you. Yes. Okay. I, so I uh, I called three four times. He didn't answer my phone. So and then I ran into uh, an individual who referred me to a guy named Boris Gorbis, very famous attorney in Hollywood, California. I went to see Boris. He's an immigrant from Russia, extremely intelligent person and then he kind of adopted me I was I was uh, probably very close to him as, as close as it can be a family member so and you I, didn't know Boris so you have this accident this guy gives you a card and says this is who you need to talk to because right. you're how old at the time I was 16 or 17 I believe so okay you get the and, and you have no idea how to deal with it or I what to do no idea what to do okay clueless <laughs> just want to get my car fixed okay the only transportation means I have and I was borrowing my brother's car the next week or so Anyway, I went to see Boris Gorbis, and Boris Gorbis, uh, he saw something and I didn't see it. He said, you know what, all my interaction with you, you know, you have been here about three, four times, and each and every time I speak to you, I find something new in you. He said, you will go places. So he'd offer me, actually, so you, you could work for me, actually. So you know what, you're my client, I'm going to settle you, okay, so you'll get your car, but i like you to work for me. I see, I see things in you, and so I'm like, I don't see it. He goes, well, you know, I'm going to help you to get a, investigation, a private investigator license, and I'll pay for your schooling. And I'm thinking of mine, I, I watched him, and I'm like, you know what? Most of the stuff he does, it doesn't match my ethics. You know, I, maybe it's, it's okay to be, you know, a lot of stuff he's doing legally is properly right, and it's, it's done, and how things are done in, you know, in legal system. But uh, my ethics and my values didn't really match what goes on in this legal system, right? I'm like, sure. I'm like, this is not who I am. I want to be able to do something different. So I said, no, I'll, I'll pass. Anyway, I uh, ended up working for an airline, came to Arizona back in the 90s. And what airline were you working Southwest for? Southwest Airline. So and what were you doing for that? I was flight up, uh, ground operation. Okay. Light and ground operation. So anyway, um, I ended up in Arizona. And then while I was working, um, I got married, and then my first child was born in 1994. And I was, I'm like, you know, if I put my kid into the a private school, he's probably going to turn out a better student than I was. This is what I'm thinking. That's my thought process sure. right now. Well, I'm like, if I can't pay, I probably can't afford to pay him in, uh, put him in a private school. So I'm like, what do I need to do? How old uh, are you when you have your first son? In twenties, somewhere in mid twenties. So okay, so you're working at South Southwest Ground Operations. You have your first son. Mm -hmm. You want to put him in a private school. You're thinking ahead, and right. you're like, I'm going to have to do something different to make different. that life a reality for reality. him. Reality. Okay. Something, something, uh, something better than what I was doing. I'm like, sure. you know, I have, I know cars. I know a lot of things. Uh, you know, I've been around cars, so I knew car. But I knew, I knew how to look at cars. So I ran into, uh, I had a. I had a coworker that recommended to for me to go buy a car when I needed a car. So I went to see this place, uh, Tempe Toyota in Tempe, and I met this this guy named Mitch Pierre. He was the owner. Well, I was talking to me, and he goes, "Where do you come from?" I said, "From California." He goes, "Yeah." So he said, "You know what? I think you know cars. So you work on airlines." Uh, and I said, "Yeah, but I want to also do something side." He said, "Why don't you start buying cars for me, and maybe you can sell them?" I said, "Okay." She gave me a first opportunity in 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 Arizona, and I bought a few cars, and I'm gonna turn around, and sold them, made a few money, three bucks. I didn't have a lot of money to work with. Sure. I gradually uh, end up. He introduced me a couple of dealerships. Uh, in the next three four years, I, I was pretty successful wholesaling cars, buying car from one dealer and selling other dealers, sending car to California. I knew California market has a better margin, so I would ship cars to California. During the whole time, I, I, one thing I always made sure that if I describe something, it has to be what I describe. So people will start trusting me, taking my words for it. So, um, and that's so a business. I think, if I mean, you, you right. know, we've all had an interaction with a car salesman who that trust wasn't there. 
But if that trust is there, and I've I've had this experience experience personally back uh, where I'm from in Wisconsin. Once you find a car dealer that you trust, you you almost never go anywhere else. This is a, I think majority of my success come from a referral and repeat business. I always wanted to make sure I told her very early in my uh, uh, my entrepreneur business, my car business. I said, you know what? I'm never going to hire a person on a commission. I don't want people to feel st- stressed when they come to my dealership. They need to feel comfortable. And so I made sure that when they leave, my employees are not calling them. My salesmen are not calling them and asking them if they're coming back for a second time and third time. And I never hired anybody in commission. I said, I'll pay you salary. You will work for me. You will get paid. If you sell a car, don't sell a car, you're still going to get paid. But make sure when people come here, you treat them just like you're taking yourself. Imagine you're buying a car somewhere else. How do you yeah. feel? So I think that's helped me a lot because, you know, and I was told many by many dealers that you will never be successful if you don't have people in commission. I said if my product is good, I don't really have to worry about much else. I think my product itself will speak. I love that. So you didn't collect their information. Okay. You didn't put them down on a spreadsheet nope. and say they bought this expensive car. We should, you know, send something to them every six months or we should, you know, call them three years and say, hey, do you need a new car? You knew that if you built the trust, you sold them a good product and you were honest about it, that they would automatically come back. And they will save me millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars on, uh, on advertisement. Because yeah. my, my best advertising is the person that buy cars for me because... If we go back to our business, our 60% of our business is referred a referral. So that saves me thousands and thousands of dollars advertising, you know. So I'm like, okay, if I sold somebody a nice car and they're happy with my car, so they may not remember that today. Maybe a year later they're going to trade, try to trade not at my place. Maybe they find something somewhere else, and then if their car get appraised pretty close to what it's worth, okay, well, they're going to realize I got a good deal when I bought the car. For yeah. Maybe they'll come back to me. It happens occasionally. People will say, you know, we went to buy car that you didn't have, but when we realized our cars are probably much as worth as we thought it was worth, and so we're like, okay, we got a good deal the first time. Why don't we go back to him? Maybe he can find a car. And then we get a lot of business back there. And so that's one thing. And I want to be, I didn't want to be normal way of doing business and car business. I thought normal is boring. Uh, you know, asking people and taking their personal information, calling them when they're having a dinner, interrupting their dinner. I thought this is totally a not me, not our business, not my style. I'm not going to operate like that. I'm going to be a little different than that. And the last 21 or so years, and we've been successful. Every single year I've been in business, we've been successful. We haven't lost some money in any, almost 21 years I've been in business. Never lost money. All 20 years have been successful. So I want to think about that. I, I, I And, and for, for me and for our listeners, listen to what Alex just said. It is the antithesis of what you hear in our society in so many industries. First off, he went into the car business and you said, I'm gonna do it completely differently. Why? Because it doesn't align with my values and my ethics and it's not how I wanna do business. And as you said, you had multiple people tell you you're never gonna be successful. You said, I don't think you're right because I know that if I adhere to my values and I treat people the way that I wanna be treated, the rest will follow. I Thank you for saying that and sharing that because I think that is so often missed in business, whether you're a small business, whether you're a large business. I think in corporate America, that concept, it's all about the bottom line and the focus on the bottom line basically erodes away at the values and the honesty and just treat others as you want to be treated that actually, if you focused on, just like you did, has led your business to have not one single year where you haven't had a profitable year. And and I, where did you get those values? Why, why did, what do you, did your parents instill those I values? I think my parents had a lot to do with it. I think my father was extremely honest. He was known to be the most honest car business, car guy in car business back home. So he's very, very honest. Even So I think I got that from him. And then only other thing is that I, I personally I have very strong values. So I think, and I value things, and I'm like, okay, you know what? I mean, I make a lot of money, but I'll make a little bit of it, but I'm will. i, I I'm gonna make sure this guy that buying car for me remembers me. And then I have people that come here, that bought a car 18 years ago, and I'm like, I don't recognize them, I don't remember them, and I go back and computer, look up their name, I'm like, oh wow, this guy was, I mean, my memory's not as good as it used to be. <laughs> but I, you know, I still said, okay, hello, sir. Uh, but this is always what happens occasionally. And so money, in your mind, and it isn't, it worth sacrificing your values. And if you focused on 
doing business the way you wanted. That just came. The rest just came. You know what helped? That I already had a job, so I was paying my bills regardless. So I, there was not much. That, you know, I was working part time. I was working a few hours. I mean, I was making enough money to pay my bills. So I was like, okay, I always have money, job. Yeah. Why would I sacrifice and and then and, 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 and lose my values to make a few extra bucks? And you know, and my always had a, this is my life goal. I will I'm always going to be do what I'm doing, and I'm always going to work. I'm just going to make sure when I'm going home, driving home, I'm not going to think that I've done something wrong. When I wake up in the morning, if I don't wake up in the morning, I always have that I didn't do anything wrong. I don't feel guilty. If I woke up in the morning, good thing, I'll go go back to normal. But I want to think, you know. Yeah. If that, I'm gone, people should remember how I made them feel, you know. That That's so refreshing to hear. And, and I want to, uh, it's just such a breath of fresh air. And as we've had lots of guests, you'll notice that there's a common theme from all the guests that we have. We had one last week that was a civil constructionist, huge contracting company on the east part of the state, almost mimicked what you said. There were a lot of job opportunities he could have taken that would have been in opposition with his values, and they said no. And just like you said, they've just been able to grow leaps and bounds because that trust was there. Now, I want to take a quick step back and say, you just brushed over it. So you're working at the airlines, mm -hmm. hard work, ground operator. Mm -hmm. You meet someone at a dealership, and they say, hey, you should start buying cars for me and then selling them yourself. And you just said, okay. Tell, tell us... Did you have to think about it? What, did that seem like a crazy idea? Because a lot of people are like, I, I, I'm working uh, in the, you know, the corporate world, or I'm doing a job that's not fulfilling. And I want to start my own thing. But taking that leap and taking that step is really scary, and it's really hard. So give us a little bit more insight into let, let me that. Take, let me take you back. I think what the guy noticed when I was looking at his car, I was going to buy a car for myself, personal mm -hmm. use. And I've noticed a few things that is a, his own staff didn't notice. And I pointed out to him, I said, this is what your car has, this is what has been done to your car, and what and this is what need to be done. And he goes, hmm. So I said, I'm looking at your car. And, you know, like a fender's been painted, I can tell you this right now. Uh, and the door doesn't align. Uh, and he looked at me and said, hmm. You were telling this to the dealer about his and car. He had not, he had, he had not <laughs> noticed that. And he's like, hmm. So where do you get this talent from? I'm like, I can look at a car. He goes, oh, mm -hmm. That's what I think. Then we realized that I need to do yeah. what I'm good at. It. And that's because but, you grew up in the car business. Right. So you knew I knew car business. Right away, he realized it. Okay. So I can tell you know car business. So I think that started the conversation. And that led me into a full-time car dealer. How did you get the money to start buying cars from I you? have no money. What are you talking about? Well, that, 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 <laughs> I have his trust. That, well, that, well, that, okay. You, you, there you go. So you had his trust, mm -hmm. and he trusted that if he gave you cars to sell, mm -hmm. when the time, when you sold them, the you would be able in, to pay him back. Him. I yeah. paid him. I, that really, what really helped me, that I had a really easy job at Southwest. You know, the flight operation, ground operation was really easy. I didn't really... I mean, I worked there, but, you know, I was there 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was gone by 12.45, you know. It was an easy job. It wasn't really that hard job. Uh, so I had ample time to do other yeah. things. So I was home by 1.30, so I had plenty of time. So that time I used to go to the dealership and pick up some trays and turn around and sell them. That helped me. Um, and Southwest was very, very, very helpful. The whole time they were very, uh, what is it, like, you know, they were they always gave me a, um, days off I needed, okay. time off I needed it, you know. So the uh, company was very good to me. I, you know, there really was a real love affair between employees and 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 the management back back in those days. Yeah, and there's a great book about that exact thing. Um, and so uh, what I so they basically wanted you to be successful. And if you moved on to to bigger and better things, they yes. were supportive of that. They were very supportive of that actually. Um, and so. Even I told me I need to be out of town for the next couple of days. I'm going to the auction in California, and no problem. Take time off. No worries. And I can tell you something right now. This is a secret that I'm, I always tell my children and everybody else. If you're an employee, you want, if you're supposed to be at work at 8.30, please get there at 8.15. Those, those 15 minutes that you get there early will do, just, will do miracle for you, for your employment, and your reputation. So my nickname was 
that South Coast Airlines was an on-time clock. <laughs> on, t- on, t- on time machine was my nickname actually. Alex the on time machine. On time machine because I was never late. I've never been late anywhere in my life. So, uh, so punctuality that's the number one secret. Number one thing I tell people be very punctual. And it's so easy to do. It's easy. But it's missed. It's so e- often missed in this day and age. And so because you were punctual, that's you're saying you showed them respect and they recognize that. And in return, they basically gave you the freedom and flexibility to to do what I wanted to, to do. To do what you wanted to do and start the side because hustle. They appreciated that, you know, I was, you know, I was punctual, responsible. And appearance is very important in anything, anywhere you got. Nowadays, I look at people, you know, flip flop, uh, you know, wearing a t shirt, yeah. uh, hat, uh, you know, backward going onto the planes. I'm like, this is not what I grew up. You know, people, appearances, how do you start a conversation with someone, right? If you are in an office or walking to someone and they look at your watch, they look at your clothes, they look at your hair, if you, you comb your while and you look good. Your parents are clean, neat and clean. There's going to be a reason they're going to start a conversation. First impression. If you look like a bum, they're going to ignore you. Yeah. Right? This first impression is very, very important, you know. So people need to... Grooming is super important to me. I yeah. Think. Now, uh, you know, when you're at home, you relax and you're in your khakis, your yeah, T-shirts. But, but, yeah, out and about, you're professional and you act accordingly. Yeah. Uh, again, I think that's one of those things that's so easy to do. Missed. But it's so missed. It's so missed in this day and age. And uh, quite frankly, I, w- I would say I'm, sometimes I'm guilty of that. Not in professional world, but um, I think just keeping, I mean, I see Alex almost on a daily basis because he owns a business not too far from where I own business. You're always very dapper. You're always dressed professionally. And, uh, you know, that commands a certain level of respect. But that leaves the impression of people. Right there. Yeah. Now, so you're, so you're doing the car dealership. Mm-hmm. Where were you? Where was your dealership located? Did you have an official location when you first started? I first started dealership in uh, I think ninety nine. Okay, it was in Mesa. And how old are you? Oh, mid twenties. Okay, 30s, okay. Like mid twenties. Yeah, or yeah, I think it was a yeah mid twenties probably. Um, I had a partner. Uh, it lasted about a month <laughs> because his value did not match my values and the way I wanted to operate. Uh, actually, I told you an incident about this. This is a true story. This is such an important, yes, so business this, partners. Pay attention to this one. So I was away for work, so I came back in the afternoon, I think, was late afternoon, and I saw a really beautiful truck parked there at the dealership. I'm like, ooh, wow, what a nice truck. Where did you get this from? So my partner said, well, I just bought it. I said, who'd you buy it from? He goes, well, this guy came in. And he was uh, he was getting evicted, and he was, uh, he was short on his rent, and uh, he, he wanted to sell it. He was desperate. I said, oh, good. What would you pay for it? And he gave me a number. I'm like, I was shocked. I said, what? what why would you pay him 10 or 12000 less than the value of the truck? He goes, well, that's what he needed it. And I was like, he needed it. Not important. What the value of the truck is important. You could give him $1,000 less. I'd be okay with it. But why did you give him s- such a little amount? I was really, really shocked. I was like, yeah. oh. and I was very, very mad. I said, this is not right. I said, call this guy back, bring him back, give him money, what the truck worth, or we're going to have a problem. He goes, no, I'm not going to do that. I ended the, uh, I ended my relationship with him that day. That moment, that moment I walked out, I said, I'm done. I left. I didn't, never went back. Wow, Alex. And I had nothing to go with. Nothing. And I came to this uh, Scasta Road to this older gentleman, I think Harry Roosevelt. So you basically lost your dealership right there. Yeah, I walked away. And I, st- I went to Harry Roosevelt. I said, look, there's about three cars that I think I had bidded from a dealership that I still have. I went to Harry Roosevelt. I was about, he was in mid-90s back then. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rent a place for me, but I want you to make a promise. So let me off, uh, off a lease if I can't make it. He goes, you got it. <laughs> And I yeah. started a dealership. You were honest with him right up front, and he oh, was I, willing well, to work with you. I said, Larry, I mean, Harry's name is Harry Roosevelt. I said, Harry, I'm going to start a dealership here, uh, and you're going to help me to get a City Tempe license. Go, oh, I know everybody's City Tempe, no problem. Did so, you know him prior to your... No, I walked in, talked, okay. started talking to him, and he's like, yeah, this place is available. And then he goes, all right. He said, how old are you? I told him, he goes, yeah, I remember my days. He goes, I struggled too, but you know what? I, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a one month penalty if you want. If you don't make a leave, I said okay, and I started a dealership. 
and then never turn back, never look back. I, I mean, just in, in the short time we've been talking, you you never were afraid to ask. You presented yourself in a way that even though these people didn't know you, Boris, for example, uh, Harry, in the situation that you just described. And a Mitch. And Mitch. Mitch was at Mitch, the... ownership at, of Tempe Toyota. Tempe Toyota. You established rapport without really them even knowing you, just by how you talk. Be who I am. You, you yeah. got to be who you saw. Talk yeah. to people. Say what you have in your mind. And, Don't and, hold back. Let them know who you are. Worse, they, okay, they move... They may not go along with you. May not, you may not get what you wanted, but just ask. Just yeah. Let them know who you are. And uh, just ask. I, you know, even I sometimes I have to remind myself. So it's so inspirational to hear you say, just ask. What's the worst that they can say? No. Now, I also like that you had someone, and all of us often have these experiences. And if you're going to be as successful in business, you do oftentimes find that the people who are most successful had someone that took them under their wing. Boris, for example. Now, your values didn't align, and you said, you know what, I appreciate it, but I'm going to move on. But you took that same character, and you applied it with Mitch, you applied it with Harry. And I think that's, again, so often missed. I, I can't tell you, Alex, how thankful I am for the advice that you're providing, because it's it seems like it's so simple, but it is just almost non-existent in today's age. Well, their existence is people don't pay well attention to it. It's not big deals anymore. You know, it's not... A, I notice a lot of people come to my dealership. I've seen them, and I talk to them, and I get a feel of them. And a lot of people have have pl- things planned, right? Mm-hmm. They have so many ways to make money, and they will, will come to some conclusion. Okay, well, then they work for months, and they overthink, overthink their ideas, overthink their planning, and they never execute. And then, then I always tell them, if you have a plan that you already thought about or you went through it, you need to execute. The worst going to happen is you're going to fail. But the next time you're going to make one less mistake, let's go go for your planning. Go for your execution. Do that. That's where people, most people fail because they don't, they're afraid of failure. Failure is, a, for me, is a, is a part of success. This is how you learn. That's what makes you move forward. Make mistakes, as many as you can, as early as possible. That's what I tell everybody. I, I couldn't have said it better. I, I, and then that's, our society has also... I think it's getting better, but this concept of failure is so terrifying, or we've created this stigma around it, and it's it's actually a wonderful thing. It's where you learn the most so that you can be successful. So let's talk about that. Alex, when have you failed? Many times. Many times I've failed in my life, but I've never looked back. One thing I've always, from the day one, I always told myself, I will never look back. I'll move forward. Whatever yesterday, bygone, bygone, I'm going to move forward. And the failure has never stopped me moving forward. I think that helps me. Get, my strength is my failure, I think. Yeah. Okay. So give us your... It, it's often helpful for all of us as entrepreneurs because we see all of these people be successful and we just automatically assume, oh, that was so easy or they didn't have any troubling times. And so I often like to ask my guests... Tell us some of the hardest times that you had and you remember and how you got through them. Not only how you actually got through them, the situation, but emotionally, how did you get through that situation? During the last uh, financial crisis, remember when the uh, market tank in what, 07, 06? Yeah, yep, 07, really 08. Yep. We have a tough time. We had a trouble making you know, ends meet because we had a ton of obligation and bank was lending money. Uh, it was hard. But uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to keep the doors open. I'm going to keep paying my employees. And I'm going to cut my personal expenses, sacrifice what I want to do, and make sure that business is open. And it was very tough because it was bankruptcy, foreclosure. People owed us money, didn't pay us. You know, it was just normal uh, back then. You know, people didn't pay, didn't pay. Didn't yeah, pay. I mean, so and people weren't buying cars back then. They were just trying to keep their houses. And so your dealership obviously suffered tremendously. But yeah, because our business is... It went down to 25, 40, 30% or so, right? And our business, the majority of our buyers are like upper middle class people. Sure. And those are the ones that are getting, got hurt the most because yeah. they, you know, the financial crisis really took everybody down. And most of the dealerships shut down in our, on Scottsdale Road. I think I was the only one available, uh, one or two. No, I was the only one that had stayed open. 
So you were the only dealership. So where we're from in in uh, from McCallop all the way from McDowell all the way down to University. I was the only dealership stayed open. Everybody else closed. So those are streets. So Scottsdale Road in in Scottsdale, Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, near Phoenix, Arizona, is like a twenty four mile main road. And on that road, there are tons of dealerships. Seventy five percent shut down. Seventy-five percent of the dealerships in two thousand eight shut down. Shut down. Most of them couldn't pay their bills, couldn't pay their employee, couldn't sell cars. You know, one thing I've really always managed, and I think I don't know who's who can I give credit to. That I always kept my uh, operational costs very low. I always think, okay, I didn't. I'm not going to sell a car whole next two weeks, so I'm going to be able to pay the bills. So this is always I think in my mind, even though I'm selling twenty-five cars. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm gonna, I'm not gonna sell a car tomorrow. I'm not gonna sell the day after tomorrow either. So you basically prepare for prepare the worst. Prepare myself for the worst time. I'm always, you prepare yourself when you're making a lot of money and you're doing real well. This the time you put the money aside for the worst time because if, if you take all the money you're making and you blew it, then you have nothing to, to fall back. So when you're making money, take a portion of the money out, put it aside for the worst time, the time that you're unexpected. So. That helps you, and that managed. I think that helped me go through the seven, oh six, seven, eight, because I had money that put aside that was helping me to pay the bills, and that helped me. And I always kept my advertising costs low, because I figured my advertisers, my individual, are buying car from me. I don't need to mm-hmm. do a lot more work. He's gonna go tell his sister, brother, mother, and all. I get that. Did you ever do any advertising other I than do word advertising and normal advertising? But I don't go out of the way. You never see my name in the billboard or radio stations or anywhere else. So what type of advertising do you do? Just normal auditorcars.com, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, okay. So online. Yeah, just normal. I don't do anything extra, you know? Okay. And so when you, I think so many of us forget, especially when you're a young business, when you have the opportunity to set money aside, do that exact thing. Even if things are incredibly um, profitable, there's going to come a time, there always, always will, there's going to come a time when you will need it. So for you, uh, you was 2007 2008 kind of unexpected for you no i anticipated that you did okay so you and and tell us why so i I was doing financing and i was looking at the loans that i was extending and i was looking at the applications and i'm like why would you live give this guy a million dollars home and his source of income is just a letter saying that you know stated income yeah it doesn't make any sense i'm like okay if that interest rate change this guy will not not gonna make it so I was telling my friends, my relative, sell your homes, market is good, don't buy anything for the next couple of years. And I did the same thing. Uh, I didn't make any sense because banks were way too relaxed. Yeah. And I didn't didn't feel comfortable. Like, you know, a lot of the people are like l- loan officers, mortgage people. And I, back in mind, I'm thinking if the market, real estate market drops even 4%, 3%, none of these guys are going to be around. Because they're living day to do, they're making hundred thousand a month. They think that's all. They're not looking at in the future. This is not going to be normal. People don't make hundred thousand dollars a month. Yeah. In, in loan, as being a loan officer, yeah. that was abnormal. That scared me actually. That got me prepared for next couple of years. Yeah, you saw it in your business. And then what helped me with I had a lot of overseas client in in the Middle East, and they were still buying. So that really helped me a lot. I shipped a lot of cars overseas. That kept me afloat for a while. That actually helped. That actually helped quite a bit because I had quite a bit uh, clients that were buying cars me over the phone. So, how did you establish that uh, international client base? Through ASU, ASU students would come buy a car for me when they're going to school, and they go back and get a nice job, get a job. Their parents will call, and uh, I think that was one reason I had uh, established. You know. Uh, lot of connection in the Middle East. I mean, that's genius. Yeah, yeah. Arizona and, State and University. Chinese, and Chinese. Yeah. And they were buying a lot of cars. Even European were, would buy occasionally cars from me. So that kept me afloat for a while. So how much would you say you typically set aside in the 2005, 2006, 2007 when you identified, oh boy, this is eventually going to end? 25% whatever I was making, I put it aside. Okay. Like, this would pay my bills for the next... The way I projected, I'm like, okay, well, next 15, 18 months, I'm probably going to lose money in every month. So let's, I figure out what my bill's going to be if I want to stay afloat. So I calculate that much amount and then I put it aside. Okay, well, that's going to probably bail me out for next year or so. And that helped me a lot. Yeah, and so you had the opportunity to potentially close. 
but you said, I'm not going to fire any of my workers. Nobody ever got fired. I've set aside money for this exact thing. You said something I think is incredible. You cut personal expenses. You, as the owner of the company, cut your personal expenses so you could keep it open during, quite frankly, the toughest economy that I've been alive in and that this this nation has experienced, at least in the last century. I mean, the obviously 1929 crash, but you cut personal expenses to keep it going. And you're burning through cash, I'm assuming. Right. You have the lead from the front, right? If you are not able to sacrifice, how do you expect other people to sacrifice their work for you? So you got to set up an example. And your employee can never should never be able to differentiate the employee and ownership. This can't be two. It's got to be same. It's got to be same page. You got to be part of a team, right? You walk in. You need to make sure everybody's think they're not a, not a member of the family walked in. So that's what I always made sure that I always go to the garage, help out my guys. I'm always out there, you know, talking to these people, trying to get a feel. Yeah. And your employees so, don't look at you as the owner. They no, look at you as a that's colleague. Why I have a long. My employees been there for years. You know. 29, 19 years, 18 years, 16 years, whatever. Um, I and never treat them as an employee. I think I the way I look at things is because these are the guys, the reason I am successful, because if they're not there, I can't do what they do. So, you know, my check writers are them, not me. That's another common theme across all of our guests is that exact thing. The people who are most successful recognize the value of their employees and they treat them exactly as they are deserve to be treated. They are the business. They're the ones that make the business happen. And your employees look at you. I, I mean, there's no question. I mean, I've, I've owned multiple businesses and they will have respect for you when you treat them not as an employee, but as another human, as a colleague. Right. Because they're more important than me. I can't do what they do, you know? Yeah. And then you have to be there before they get to it. So I'm always at work before anybody, as you know, that yep. I come early morning, yep. I have a coffee with you yep. guys and and before the store's open, I'm already there. I I walk in, I open the dealership every morning. Been doing it for years. I always get that I'm the very first one that walked in. Yep. You're, you're, that, the, you're the first person there, and you're the last person that, that leaves That creates every day. an employee, hey, we need yeah. to be on time because he's already there, right? That helps. Yeah. You can't walk in 11 o'clock when it's, you know, your dealership open at 9. You miss out the most important part of the day. It's the first two hours. How are your employee feels? What's yeah. missing? What do you need to be done? So you got to get there early. What drives you to continue doing what you're doing? Interaction with people. I love being talking to people. I get very successful people and the people that are going through a rough time or a tough time. Having conversation with me is my my ultimate success. It's pleasure, I believe. It's, it's just what I enjoy. I, I get I talk to them. I get a feel of them. And, like, and it's not work for you. You, yeah, you thoroughly enjoy it. And then they're from all over the world. Like, yeah. They're not just local people, right? Yeah. Uh, and I enjoy the culture, talking the, the way they speak, and the way they interact with their family members, their spouses, and the children. It's just, I just love it. You know, I can close my store today and say, you know what, I'm done. I can walk away, and I should be able to make a living but, for the rest of your life and for your family. Yeah, you know, I mean, not uh, able to make a living. I can yeah, say that. Yeah. You know, maybe a maybe in modest way, but yeah. Uh, coming to work is, I I I just enjoy it. You know, and that's what bring bring me to work. I enjoy talking to people. You know, enjoying just being around people from all over the world that come to our dealership, especially from, you know, especially if Canadians here or Chinese or yeah. immigrants, whoever. It's just fun. And then, you know, and then their accent, I, I enjoy their accent, you know, and I try to intimate them, like, you know, hey, I don't share what you're talking about, but I do. And just to get a yeah, out of yeah. it, you know, right? And then, then I do, uh, <laughs> it's nice. Then I try, I practice their action when they leave. Like, you know, let's see if I can talk to like them, you know? That's it's pretty fun. cool. It's, yeah, it's I, 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 and I, I, I appreciate, um, you know, trying to put yourself in their shoes and say, hey, can I talk with the accent that they have? I'm terrible with accents, so I'm not even going to attempt to do it. But tell me about, so you've had a successful dealership since uh, the late 90s. And I know that you've, as you've garnered that success, uh, built your financial uh, net worth, You've invested in areas outside of the dealership. Talk to us about those. Well, there's always got to be a fallback, right? So you need to have, you need to venture out. You got to have multiple, when you're successful, you're only going to be successful if you venture yourself out and you have other venues, right? So at the beginning, you're putting all your money into the business and Make then eventually- It's stable. Yep. And then once it's stable- You venture out. You're diversifying. Diversify you, because now you know the- the business in cruise control, right? Yeah. Well, you have time to get out and do other things, right? 
So you almost got to do it. You can't put all your bag, eggs in one basket, right? It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. You need to have, so always have a second or third venue. So I figure, okay, well, they can't make more land here, right? The land yep. is only yep. limited. So get into land business. Maybe do rental properties. Maybe do some other stuff, right? Um, and so that's what you've been doing. I if I see money, I buy anything. If I see a watch that I can turn on, make a few bucks. Yeah, I, I wear it. I like it, and I'll buy it because uh, you know, ultimate goal is to use it and sell it and yep. get out of it. Right? Uh, I'll make a few bucks. I, I love so many of the things that you've talked about because not once has money driven you. Of course, you have to pay for your bills and you have a family that you need to provide for. But not once have you said you money did it for the never money. Never my ultimate goal. It's nice to have it. Because then you can help other people, yeah. or you can help your own family, right? Yeah. It's nice to have it. Your hands always got to be pointing down, not like pointing up. That's my whole life scenario. Oh, I that's a good have, I want to point down, not up. Not up, yep. No, that's what I don't want to do. You know, it's uh, it's money is a it's is a part of part of life. It's important, but not the important, the most important thing. I don't see that. I mean, most people do, but I don't. I don't believe that. I think money is just another part of. Your life, it's, you have it, is good. Well, and I, I, I think that the reason you've been so successful is because your focus has not been on the money. Because, fair to say, money doesn't make you happy. Never have. It's just the enjoyment around what I do. You yeah. Know? It's just the thrill I get out of do what I do, you know, buy an exotic car, turn on salt to some some guy that has money. Okay, then I, when I get, get to talk to him, I'll figure out how did he make money. So then I got an education going on. I'm learning yeah. something with this guy. You're learning you made your first million. Yeah. You made your next 10 million, right? Well, selling cars is just a very small part of this thing. The main thing is I'm bringing a guy in that, like the other day, last week, guy flew. I just told you about this guy flew yeah. in a private jet. Yep. He, he flew in for uh, Super Bowl, and he landed at the Phoenix airport, and they gave him a Chrysler van. He's like, huh? I booked uh, Mercedes. Well, no, that's gone. So he's like, all right, no choice. He was driving by a neighborhood, and he saw my dealership he pulled in and he goes uh, you know I, I've got two kids really three actually three little girls and wife and I've, I've got this Chrysler and we have got all these fancy beautiful cars and I really am going to Super Bowl I'm very close to Fletcher Cox and you know I'm going to hang out with him and, that's and, someone and, famous yeah it's a good place where you go okay anyway, he goes uh, I have a VIP suit and I'm going to drive this Chrysler van so do you think you can help me I said I don't rent cars that's not what we do here. We sell cars there. He goes, yeah, well, I'm only going to be here three days. So I started talking to the guy, and the first 30 seconds, I realized this guy is, is successful. I can just tell by talking to him, right? Yeah. His demeanor, his, his aura, I can tell. I said, I'm going to make an exception. I'm going to make an exception, which I'm going to do. I didn't tell him I'm the owner, right? I said, well, Yeah, I love that. You didn't I tell said, him you're the owner. No, I said, I'm, gonna, I'm not allowed to do certain things here, but I'm going to make an exception for you. I'm gonna give you Lamborghini Urus. That's what you're gonna drive today. He was like, a Lamborghini Urus, and wow. an SUV. I said he was like, oh, I want some things out. He was looking at, I think he was looking at a few of my Lamborghinis. He's like a, he's like I need an SUV. I'm like, okay, well I got a uh, Mercedes GLE 63, whatever. But he goes, yeah, I'm like Ferrari Lamborghini guy. So I gave him Lamborghini. I said I'm gonna give you the keys, give you insurance papers, and I'm gonna give you this car to drive. Go have fun. So he took the car, and the way out, he had me uh, he a handshake. Then I looked at it, he gave me a $500 tip. I'm like, huh? He goes, man, I'm going to pay you, and help, help, thanks for helping me out. I'm like, I don't think he knows I own this place, and I don't think I'm going to tell him. I think that's such an awesome story, Alex. So you, you, were, you went to help him out. You didn't ask him for money or anything. No, I just said, you know what? I don't do that. I don't rent cars, but, you know. You made an exception. I'm like, what is he going to do? Tomorrow we're closed. Monday's going to bring the car back. Yeah. No worries, you know. Uh, actually, I gave that $500 away to another guy, homeless guy. I didn't keep it. Uh, it oh, wasn't for me anyway, so I kept the giveaway. Gave away. Um, the very same day I went and gave away. Um, regardless. Anyway. Um, and then uh, he came back Monday, turned the car in. He was very happy. Paid me quite a bit of money, which is fine. Uh, and then at the airport, he sent pictures. He's flying with a private jet back to Austin. I, I, again, it's just about treating people right and helping people out. Now, there's a story that is 
again, I, I, a lot of these stories have the, the same themes and principles. Value your, uh, basically place the most amount of significance on your values and just treat people the way you want to be treated. Tell us the story of the individual who put you on his life insurance policy. Oh, yes. There's a guy named Michael Disney. So back in, I think, early 2000, 2003 and 2004, and I've got a, uh, there was a dealership up the street that opened up Morningstar Auto. So I was doing some business with him. There was a guy that used to do run around for them guys, a gopher type of guy. And so he would come pick up cars. And so I started talking to the guys. And then um, one of the guys that owned the dealership said, you know what, you need to, I'm going to be out of business. I cannot, uh, this time stuff is, you know, I don't think I can make it. But this guy you should uh, hire and then give him an opportunity. I said, I said what year was this? This I think 2005, I believe. Okay, so six, another, maybe six, maybe six, okay. six yeah. So another dealership's going to go under and has a good employee that that he wants to make sure is well taken care yeah. of and comes to you and says, yeah. "Will you hire this guy?" I said, uh, "Tell me something about this guy. How do you know him?" He said, "Well, I met him in Albuquerque. He grew up with me. He was my childhood friend. He had some rough time, tough times. What rough time?" I asked him. I said, "What happened, this guy? What are you talking about?" If, but this guy seemed really nice, very educated, very well mannered. What what did he go through? He goes, well, he was involved in. He was a uh, he graduated college, and then uh, he became a cop in Me- New Mexico, and then uh, he went into DEA. Then he associated drug enforcement with, agency. Yes, and okay. then he became an agent, and then he 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 was associating with this bar guy that owned a bar a restaurant something like that, and the bar owner was selling drugs, and he busted him. And then, uh, so Mike Disney, now busted. a DE agent, busts this bar, bar owner for doing right. drugs. Drug. Okay, selling drugs. I think he was selling selling drugs. something, peddling drugs. Anyway, okay. Anyway, they became somehow they became partner, and Michael Disney was uh, letting him sell drugs, protecting him, whatever. Anyway, they end up he ended up becoming a state witness or a federal witness, and turned Michael Disney in, and Michael ended up getting a five years solitary uh, confinement in Albuquerque prison so he did five years he got out i mean he obviously made a lot of mistakes they're getting into business with someone he had just busted as a de agent uh, you know we don't know exactly what happened I, there maybe I, I don't really i i know some but as vague i forgot a lot of things told me but he uh he was a stand-up student was a nice guy grew up mm-hmm. in a good family he came to arizona and then he worked for morning Colorado, and then he end up uh you know i ended up talking to him and i told his boss i said you know what i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna give this guy an opportunity to work for me I'm going to figure out, uh, I'm going to give him a job. So I hired him. And he goes, I, and while he's working for me, he says, you know what, I wanted to be a lawyer. And he said, if I was a good lawyer, I probably would have never gone to jail. Uh, he said, let me help you out to get me into ASU. I said, well, go apply for it. He got into ASU Law School. Wow. And then he goes, well, you're going to help me. I said, I'll pay. I'm going to put you on a payroll as an employee, but you go full-time school. And you can work whenever you want do a couple of runs for me. So I paid through his uh, tuition. He graduated a common law, a top the class at ASU. Mm-hmm. Why did you give him this opportunity? Because I needed to know if this guy's for real. So I wanted to see if I could put him through one or two semesters. I'll see his grade. And I wanted to make sure what I'm reading, it's what I thought it's okay. going to be. I, I wanted to check my... I was did, actually testing my own judgment that okay. was I doing I wasn't for doing for him I like that me. okay so it was kind of a selfish you wanted to make sure that you were I was reading right reading who this person this character who his demeanor was yes, properly. and I wanted okay. to test myself I'm like yeah what is gonna cost me two semester fees so let's yeah. do that let's see what happens so it wasn't for him. It was back back then. It was selfish. I was thinking about myself. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna test my own judgment. Well, at least you're honest. I was gonna say, you know, Mitch gave you an opportunity. Harry gave you an opportunity, and maybe it was selfish for them. But now here it is, your chance to give someone an opportunity, which you do. There might be a little bit of selfish motive for it, but it's yeah, it's like, okay. certainly beneficial to him. So he went to the ASU, graduated with the common law, top the class. Yep. Right. Then he was applying for a law school a bar. Uh, well, yeah. sorry, for the bar, right? He had to get. He couldn't get in, uh, get into a bar. He was. Everybody he had turned a felony down on his he had record. A felony. Yeah. Depressed, and uh, I kept telling him, you know what? There's other things to do. So he got into insurance business, right? Mm-hmm. 
So he goes to ASU, graduates from ASU Law School, top of his class, and part of that, you have to pass the bar exam, and then the state bar has to admit you. He didn't get in because of felony? Yeah, so my older sister is an attorney, and she's an attorney in four different states, and if you have a felony, it's almost impossible to get admitted. It's like penalizing the, a person over and over yeah, and over. Yeah. Forgiven is, forgiveness is forgotten. That's yeah. what I thought. So I'm like, no, anyway. So Long that's not going to work out, basically. So he became an insurance agent. Yeah. So, and he was still doing work for me, like, you know, running, doing, repoing my car, mm -hmm. picking up car, dropping car, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then I noticed a huge change in his mood, his behavior, his demeanor. And I'm like, what's going on, Michael, with you? He goes, I'm depressed. I don't want to live anymore. There's no purpose for me. I don't want to sell insurance. And so anyway. That's so yeah, sad. Long story short, he uh, he borrowed some money and moved to Costa Rica. He said, I'm going to work as a private investigator. Then he called me about a year later after he was moved. He goes, well, you need to come here. I'm doing really good. And I'm like, you sound like you're drunk. Are you drinking? I thought he stopped drinking. He goes, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm depressed. And anyway, so he drank himself to death. But he'd call me in like a six month, maybe three, six or three months before I died. So he literally drank himself to death. Uh, yeah, he purpose, died purposely. He said, yeah. "I have your name. I, I'm gonna name you." Since I was selling insurance policy, there's four one point four million dollars insurance policy there. I'm gonna make you. I, I have your name in the insurance policy, and with other, another guy, some guy from Las Vegas. I said, "Why do you have my name in there?" He goes, "Well, you paid a lot of money for my tuition." I said, "I paid. I wrote it off as my business expense. It's not a big deal. I don't need any money." He goes, mm -hmm. And I said, "I'm. I'm I have." I have money, Mike. You don't need to give me anything. I want nothing from you. Uh, I wanted you to be a lawyer, but, you know, we both failed, so let's move on. And he goes, no. I said, please, take my name off the life insurance policy. I don't want you to die. And then I collect and I benefit from your death. I said, that's not who I am. So he goes, well, whatever. So anyway, I have, I have not talked to him for the next three, four months. And then I this, this one day a guy walked into my office. He goes, hey, uh, you know Michael Disney's death? I'm like, how do you know? He goes, yeah, he died. I'm like, hmm. He said he drank to death in Costa Rica. I I went and picked up his body, and I have insurance uh, documents, and that has your name in it and my name in it. I said, oh. So he didn't listen to you. He, he didn't take he, your he, name he off. He crossed over your name from 75% uh, to 25%, and mine's 50%. And so he amended the policy after a discussion with you. But he's still uh, entitled 25% as a uh, proceeding. And I'm like, you know what? I really don't even need that, honestly. He goes, well, you have to take it anyway because your name's there and then insurance policy is there. The insurance company is asking for your contact number, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Anyway, so he paid me back what I pay, spent on him before he left. Th so that's obviously a very sad story. But, but again, the point is... You weren't expecting anything from this individual. You no. gave him an opportunity to be successful. And, and that didn't work out. And, and it, you ended up getting it back and then some. Yeah. And I think you, you, you gave everything over the expenses away, didn't you? More. Yeah. yeah. yeah I but mean, that was it, not... Uh, I wasn't expecting him to die. I thought he was 36 no, of course, years old. Yeah. A 36 old man doesn't die. They no. don't commit suicide. They don't drink themselves that. You yeah. Know, but this has just happened when you're, when you're emotionally distraught. These things happen. People... More, I mean, he was a strong guy, but he could only take so much. Yeah. Well, and that's that's true, I think, for all of us. So, again, this is just, you know, if, if you just focus on values and, and other humans, I think you can be successful in any business. I think your life story proves that far and away. Now, you've been very gracious with your time. So just a few more questions, Alex. If you, what advice would you give to someone who is, regardless of their age, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they're maybe stuck working in the corporate world or working for someone else, and they have this entrepreneurial drive, but they they don't know what steps to take. They don't know what industry to go in. They just don't know what to do, but they know they want to do something. Yeah, they could do multiple things. I mean, if they want to... A lot of people know what they like and what do they okay. know. So, I mean, you know, planning, overthinking... It's always a big strawback. You always got to plan, execute. Execution where you fail. If you don't execute, you'll, you never know if you were going to be successful. 75% of people I talk to uh, don't execute. They just think, overthink, and then they get scared. Uh, the f 
So they never the take action. Of fear of failure is the biggest, biggest drawback for anyone. You got to do it. I understand there is going to be a failure. There's going to be some issues, but take a chance, you know. And then don't overthink. Please think, figure out what you're going to do, and do it. Period. I, uh, execute. I mean, if, execution's a ninety percent. The the ninety ninety percent of your your failure is success, but ninety nine percent is a, is is essential for you to do something. It's execute. Execute, execute, execute. Do nothing else, execute. Plan, figure out what you want to do, and then execute it. Don't overthink. Don't change your mind. Don't, just do it. If you talk to 10 people, you're going to have 10 different advisors, right? Don't talk to 10 people. <laughs> talk to two people. I like that. Okay? Don't need to talk to 10 advisors. You don't need that. Do two people. If you're going to go in a car business, talk to two car dealers. You don't need to talk to 10 different, okay? And then do what you need to do. If you want to sell medicine, talk to two doctors, two pharmacists, and done. Don't talk to 10 different people. So you're going to have 10 different opinions, confusion, and then it's going to, you'll do nothing. You'll sit and move on, do something else, or do nothing. Don't do that. Do something. Be it'll a just, doer. It'll just perfect, perpetuate the fear if you get too many people's fear opinion. Is a, fear is the biggest, biggest drawback. Don't be. If you're young, take make as many mistakes as you can. Don't do it when you're in 50s. Do it when you're 15 and 18 and 19. And oh, I followed that advice. Right. I'm telling you. <laughs> and then there's not, you know, we don't have a traditional way of uh, earning anymore. It's not tradition anymore. You don't nine to five job. There's there's venues. COVID have given you opportunity to learn, execute, ex- and have experience yourself and your, your approach. You can, you can apply yourself to many things, right? Do something, you're good at it, right? And then... Uh, I see a lot of kids come here, you know, these are, what, TikTok star or YouTube yeah. or whatever, and they're buying $200,000 cars. I always say, why do you need this car? This money you're making right now is not permanent. It's probably not going to have it. For, is something else going to pop up or somebody else can do something else? Maybe buy a $25,000 car and I'll take this money and buy a land. I sometimes turn down kids by buying a car from me. I said, this doesn't make sense. So they want to buy from you. You know that they're making a big mistake and, and I, you don't let them I, buy. No, I turn them away. I said, no, go Because you're looking out for them. Yeah. It's just me. I'm looking at them. Like, what is My son would do the same thing. I'll tell him, hey, no, don't do that. Yeah. You can't do that. I don't, you don't need to buy. Like I had a kid came 23 years old, but I want to buy a McLaren. Show me a bank account. I'm like, wow, $100,000 monthly income. Some big star. And I'm like... Reason with me. Why do you need this McLaren? Your insurance is going to be twice or more or three times more. How much was the McLaren? It was $176,000 car. He was going to put down 120 cash. And he was, I'm like, why would you need this car, kiddo? He goes, oh. I said, look, your insurance is going to be real high. This car is a high maintenance car. I don't think you should buy this. He goes, well, I w-. I'm like, look, I know you're 23. You made a lot of money. Don't you think you can do better with your money? Well, I don't, I don't get along with my mom. I don't get along with my dad. I'm like... Do you get along with your banker? He goes, yeah. I said, that, you think the <laughs> banker's looking out for you? If you don't think yes, and then go talk to him. Yeah. And then he goes, yeah, but, you know, I was like, look, I don't see you buying this car. I don't see you driving this car, honestly. I'd be afraid if you're driving my car. You wouldn't know how to drive this car. This car is hard to drive. He goes, what else can I buy? I said, well, here's, I'm going to tell you what. I have a really nice, beautiful BMW. I'm not a BMW guy. What do you want? I want a Ferrari. I ended up not doing business with this kid. He because ended up he, buying a car somewhere else, though. He wouldn't take your advice, and he... he, he uh, Stubborn. Wow. I, I mean, again, I ethics. I mean, that's just what you've just described. And, and I think, unfortunately, hopefully it turns out well for him, but more than likely the odds are not in his favor. I really haven't had... I heard he was not doing well a few years, a few months ago, somebody told me. But he had come back. I think he did come back one more time. I am sure... Uh, he came maybe twice. I'm sure he came one more time just uh, looking for me. I wasn't there that day. I think I was in the country. Then he came back again, and I'm not sure what happened. I think he was looking to trade car back, and he was upside down or something. I can't remember what happened. He crashed one of the car. I, 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 I was vaguely, I remember something happened. But anyway, the kid wasn't really listening, so yeah. I can only say something. You know, you know. So I love what you said. You know, Even you practice this yourself. I looked at what I was good at, my skill set, and what I liked. It took me a little while to get there. I was working at Southwest, but when the opportunity presented itself, someone trusted me and I took the opportunity. You executed. Tell us 
Uh, one of the last questions here for you. Being in business is incredibly emotionally volatile. Very volatile. How have you coped and what advice would you give to other people, especially people who are really struggling financially in business? Because those first few years are so hard. And the, the first few years in the garbage company, uh, as I've shared, are why I started this podcast for all of us to be a support group, to have these conversations. And so I always ask all of our guests, how have you dealt and coped with the emotional volatility that comes with being a business owner? And what advice do you can you give to someone who's in having a really hard time dealing with that? Well, you miss out a lot of things because you're you're at work. As a business owner, you're never off, right? Your phone's always on. Yeah. So there's a sacrifice. You have to sacrifice. You miss out many occasions in your family. You know, you, you don't go to a lot of family parties because you're not able to go yet, right? So learn to sacrifice. Learn to cope with it. You can't always, always everywhere, right? You got to yeah. be somewhere. And then so sometimes you have to sacrifice. Sometimes you feel like you miss out, but, you know, the payback. Okay, well, the day I miss my second union in school or something, my kid's school, but I was able to pay a tuition for private schools, right? So I was compensating and buying it, but you know. I mean, that's a great, so you missed you, his second, you know, they've got a they've got a celebration for every age now, second six, grade, third grade, fourth grade. So, yeah, yeah, so, we didn't have that so, when I grew up, right? So, yeah, I said, me either. So you missed the second grade year-end party, but you were able to pay for their private college because private you, college. you worked you and worked. you continued You know, working. there's a give and take, right? Yeah. I'm like, all right, so I'll get the next one. Yeah. Right? But I got better things, you know, I got things more important than that. I'm committed to something else. But anyway, there is sacrifice. There's going to be some issues. This is how every business is, you know, but you, you need an understanding partners uh, so, or you need to just learn to sacrifice. There's many things you might be able to go. I had a ticket to go some Super Bowl game, I think, back in 15, whatever. Mm -hmm. I didn't go because I had a commitment to be a dealership. So you sacrifice, right? You could have gone to the Super Bowl, but you had a I commitment in your business. I was given a ticket by a football player. I didn't go. I'm like, no, we have be I got better things to do. Instead of me going spending a few bucks here, I'm going to make some money here and I'll watch some TV. So this, you got to sacrifice. Just learn to sacrifice, and, you know, and then, you know, nothing perfect in life. And and you have, you said something that I, that I want to ask briefly about. You said, supportive individuals around you, your family supportive, the people that are very in your important. life are supportive. Essential, very essential. You got to have family around you to support you, uh, spouse, girlfriend, whatever. They need to understand, you know. Yeah, there's a Valentine Day. You won't remember the Valentine Day. It wasn't for Nordstrom, Macy's, and Broadway, you know. Yeah, yeah. They made a big deal out of it, right? Valentine Day is every day Valentine Day. But, yeah, you got to sacrifice. Learn to sacrifice. Spouse and need to understand. There's a reason you're able to go shop at Nordstrom or whatever because he's at work making money, making sure you're able to buy what you want to buy, right? Yeah. So don't ask for, you know, uh, to him to sacrifice work because when he goes to work, he makes money and then you're able to do things, right? Yeah. Right, so... It goes both ways. It's I mean, just, you need to adjust, right? Yeah, and, and I think that's important. If you're in a business or you're thinking about starting a business, it's so important to talk to the people around you and make sure that they're on board because if they're not, it you won't work. Learn to talk to you, whoever you bid, learn to let them know, hey, look, this is what I'm gonna do. Yeah. This is what required for me to be successful. You're on board? They let them know. Don't just be be honest up front. Hey, my business is, you know, requires me so many hours. This is what I'm going to work. The fruit is that, that you will be able to do things that you want to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So catch 20. Anything else that you want to share with our listeners that you have found particularly important in your uh journey of success, both personally and professionally, that we haven't talked about I'm already. I'm going to get a lot of crap of this, but the school's not helping. I see a lot of kids with the high debt and no no scope, no future, no nothing, no jobs, nothing. They come in with some, unless you're getting a professional engineering degree or like a medical degree, most of school really doesn't teach you anything. You're paying a lot of money, you're heavily debted, and you get out of the school, you're making barely any money. Most of your money going to the pay your loans. And so... You're talking about colleges. Colleges. Colleges are not teaching a lot. I thought college teaches you reasoning, right? Uh, reasoning, mannerism, all that is not there anymore. You're I seeing like, that's uh, not the I, case. I, I see, I talk to kids all the time. They come yeah. 
I see that they have degrees and they're working at dealership or car wash or whatever. You know, this bogus degrees are worthless. And so if you're going to school, go for purpose. So I'm hearing that more and more. That that so, so go for purpose. What if if you're someone who's kind of grown up and our society is slowly starting to realize the value of community colleges, technical colleges, but we still have that. Oh, we got to get a degree. You got to get a bachelor's. You got to get a degree. And I'm not saying it can't be helpful. And of course, the statistics show. Uh, get, these are historical statistics that people that have a degree tend to make more money. But I don't know that that's true anymore. And I'd be very curious to see how that changes over the next 20, 30 years. So what advice would you give to them? given what you've just stated about. I think school is essential. You got to go to school and, you know, but if you're going to the college and you want to go to graduate school, pick something that that's going to help you and get you a job. Don't go to school just for to get a degree. Just a degree doesn't do anything. Get a degree, something that's meaningful. Get a degree in computer science, or IE, whatever, in artificial intelligence, AI, or whatever. Get something. Don't go in there just to get a degree in philosophy and psychology. None of those going to help, right? You will be jobless. Yeah. Your your loans, uh, your your you're going to be heavily debited, and you have no money to pay for them. You're, all the money you're going to make is going to go to the tuition and your, on your loans and rent, whatever. So go to school, but for purpose. That's great advice, and I think it's not given uh, nearly frequently enough. Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This has been fantastic. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for all of the stories that you've shared with us. I'm sure all of you guys have appreciated this. And for me, getting to hear this over and over again, we often see there's so many stories out there, whether it's American Greed on Netflix. We hear the evils of business. I think if you really boil it down and you talk to the people who are most successful, you have stories just like Alex's, where they have values, they have ethics, they treat other humans how they want to be treated. And I think the more we talk about that, I think uh, the, the, the more we're going to be able to make a difference from that perspective in the business world. Alex, thank you again so much for joining thank us this you. week. My pleasure. Take care. Thank yeah. you very much. Enjoy. That's all the time we have for this week's podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Andrew Holland Podcast. Also, go to our website, theandrewhollandpodcast.com, if you want to learn more about the podcast and about my background outside of the podcast. And lastly, follow us on Twitter, A Holland Podcast. As a reminder, this is a business podcast. Sometimes we talk about legal things. Sometimes we talk about financial things. Sometimes we give advice. If you're in a particular situation, make sure you always consult the appropriate professionals for your situation to make sure you're getting the best advice that applies to you. Never take something you hear from a podcast and apply it to your situation. It may not work exactly in your situation. General business advice. If there's anything that you want us to talk about, any questions you want me to ask guests every week that I haven't been asking, please email me. Again, go to the andrewhollandpodcast.com or Ask me on Twitter, A Holland Podcast. This is a podcast that is supposed to be a community of business minded individuals, and it's as good as you guys make it. The listeners, when you give me more input on what I should do differently, or questions I should ask, or topics we should cover, the better it's going to be. So don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you again so much for joining us this week. You guys all have an excellent week, and we'll talk again next Wednesday. Thank you for listening to the Andrew Holland Podcast. Be sure to visit our website, theandrewhollandpodcast.com, for additional content on business, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Andrew Holland Podcast, to get notifications when new podcasts have been released. And lastly, follow us on Twitter, A Holland Podcast. That's A Holland Podcast for all the conversations we're having outside the podcast. Thanks again so much for joining us this week. Have a great day, and we'll talk again next week.